Well, good morning, afternoon, wherever you are, I guess. But uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, excited about today's conversation, presentation that we're doing, the Accountants 24, 2024 marketing playbook uh, with me and we'll get to meet him a little bit deeper uh, shortly as Terrell Turner, a uh, good friend of mine. And, and I'm really excited to be doing this with uh, Terrell today. So before I jump in, Terrell, hello. <laughs> hey, thank you for having me. Yep, no problem. This is this is uh, this is exciting. This is a, a I think a great topic. Um, just so everybody knows, we're going to do a little housekeeping here. But this is what we're calling the Bridging the Gap Conference Preview Series. This is a third uh, webinar we're doing as a preview of our conference, um, the conference that uh, we will be presenting in Rosemont, Illinois, July 22nd through 24th. Uh, Rosemont is about a five to 10 minute uh, taxi ride from O'Hare Airport. Um, if anybody wants more information on that, you can scan the QR code over on the right, or you can just go to btgconference.com. Uh, Terrell will be a speaker. Uh, this uh, this uh, session or these preview sessions are highlighting speakers we're having at the conference. And I put the title of his session down there below the Bridging the Gap, Content Marketing for Accountants. Uh, so very on point with what we're talking about today, but will be a, a lot different than we talk about today <laughs> as well. Um, so uh, that's the information on the conference. Before we jump into the the content today, ooh, content, content marketing, there we go. Before we <laughs> jump in the content for today, uh, this is available for CPE. So to get your CPE, you need to be logged in for at least 50 minutes, and you need to answer at least three of the four polling questions, which will pop up during the presentation. I will let you know. We will announce it. Make sure you're paying attention. And uh, uh, the certificates, assuming that you meet those requirements, will be emailed to you within, actually, that's important to the email address you registered with. So remember that. Make sure you check your spam and junk email folders because sometimes they show up there. But you'll get those certificates within the next 24 hours. Uh, these slides are available under the, and we always get to this question, but the slides are available under the uh, resources tab here within Cvent, which is the platform we use. Also, the presentation will stay open for about 10 minutes after we end, so you can go fill out the survey, which again is on the right side there, uh, NASBA requirement uh, that we at least offer that to you. So fill out the survey. I'm sure Terrell will get like 100% across the board with uh, <laughs> anything that he uh, puts on. You don't have to worry about uh, me, I'll, I, I, zero, zero, okay. Um, and then this presentation will be on our YouTube channel within 24 hours. So you can go back or you can refer people to that. Also, we will uh, try to address any questions that pop up. So if you do have questions during the presentation, put those over in the Q&A tab and we will be notified that those questions are out there. All right, that is housekeeping. Real, we're talking about marketing, so I guess I'm going to market here for a second. Uh, but just letting you know who Trimerit is. Trimerit puts these on. Trimerit uh, hosts the conference. Trimerit uh, hosts my podcast, the Unique CPA Podcast. So Trimerit is a specialty tax uh, uh, firm. We deal with credits and incentives. We support tax advisors, CPAs, EAs, tax preparers, tax advisors by allowing them to bring tax saving opportunities to their clients. And you can see the list there at the bottom of the things that we deal with. A key one uh, that I get a lot of questions on still right now is ERC. Um, and we are still in ERC filing mode, even though there is a potential that that went away already. Uh, we're waiting for the Senate to vote on that. Anybody watching on YouTube may already know if that happened or not. Um, but if you're watching live as of this moment, uh, nothing's changed there. But we also are helping uh, uh, clients determine if they really did qualify or not, because there was a lot of unfortunate uh, information out there where people took advantage of it when they shouldn't have. All right. Who am I? Uh, Randy Crabtree. There's my list of stuff. Bottom line is I go out and talk a lot on whatever topic I feel I'm passionate about. Um, uh, marketing is Terrell's passion, but I do enjoy that too. So, uh, and then I'm going to let Terrell in introduce himself. Uh, Terrell, take it over. Yeah, I will say it's definitely an honor to be on with one of the top 100 influential people in accounting, Randy Crabtree. I mean, that right. is huge. Yeah. Right. I would say you can't move past that one too quickly. 
<laughs> well, see, the pressure's on. Once you get it once now, you got to work to make sure you get it again. So I try to ignore it right now. <laughs> gotcha. Well, so my my background is very similar to what you said. I mean, I'm a CPA. I run an accounting practice. I probably started in accounting like most people. It just started off working in public accounting and did that for years and about three, a little over three years ago, started my, left the, the corporate world, started my own practice. And I mean, at the time it was what, April 1st of 2020 is when I started the firm, which is when everything started shutting down for COVID. So we had to figure out a very creative way to get the message out about what we do and to try to get the attention to really build a business. And so all of my business started, I guess you'd say, post the start of COVID to where we really had to get very creative and it's led to some great opportunities. I mean, being recognized as a top finance influencer, multiple 40 under 40 CPA awards. I currently, our target audience are law firms and I currently am the chair of the American Bar Association Law Firm Finance Committee. So great opportunity of how we use the content to get us in places to grow the firm and to grow a personal brand as well. And we continually create new content. One of the newer projects we're doing is called a meme of the week, uh, which is something a lot of people are, are finding to be funny and informative. Um, so we're always trying to find new ways to really get in front of our target audiences and provide them with a little bit of entertainment and some insight as well. I got a question on that meme of the week. Is that uh, AI generated? <laughs> so the photo is AI, AI generated. I, I, right. I challenge my I challenge my marketing assistant. So I have a marketing assistant in the Philippines, and I challenge her to like explore new tools to make our process a little bit faster. And so she came across the AI generation of creating pictures, and I'm like, all right, we'll we'll work with it. Now the funny thing is. AI tends to have a spelling problem. So <laughs> it, it originally, it spelled meme wrong. So we had to figure out using another AI tool to help us figure out how do we correct the spelling that the first AI tool generated. And once we figured it out, I'm like, okay, all right, now we can use it now that we can correct the spelling. <laughs> Yep. All right. So I think that's just important to realize technology is a big part of or can be a big part of marketing as well and not ignoring new technologies. All right. One thing I want to point out, because you pointed out my, my top 100, that's 100. You're a 40. You, you, you got a much more prestigious <laughs> list and you've got three different of those lists. So in addition, the bestest uncle in the world. So you can't pass that. Right, so. You know, I always tell people, I was like, according to my nephew's in the UK, I am the bestest uncle in the world. I didn't give myself that title. They gave it to me, so I wear it proudly. <laughs> it's a title for sure. And then I wanted to just point out, because we were talking about marketing, and, and Terrell, in my mind, he is he is one of the best at this, and he's out there constantly. And if you go look on LinkedIn, um, you'll see him out there often. But here's a bunch of different – these are all different podcasts that you do, correct? Yeah, so these were different podcasts and different concepts as we were, we realized like trying to speak to different audiences instead of just having one show that tries to talk to everyone. We said, well, what if we created different shows, almost like a network, and we created different shows so people knew, hey, if you're a church, this is the show you watch. If you're a restaurant, this is the show you watch. And it became a, a really smart marketing strategy. Yeah, for sure. And I, I've seen that as well. And we can't, we, we'd be, I'd be remiss if I did not point out the top right corner. He is also a, a <laughs> Notre Dame grad as well as Landry <laughs> University. Um, and so that's a big deal. That's a, that's a very prestigious school. So, uh, well, thank all right. you. <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's, before I even jump into marketing, I want to set the stage with the history of marketing. But before I do that, Sean and Sean Fang is with us as well behind the scenes, uh, making sure everything runs smooth. Sean, can you pop up the first polling question, please? And that should be popping up now. So go there. It's a very simple question. Are you still here? Yes or no? And either answer uh, will get you credit. So even if you say you're not here, you still get credit for being here. 
All right. While that poll is up, and, and Sean will leave that up for a minute or so, I'm going to move on to the uh, to the uh, the setting the stage for here. So let's talk about marketing, and, and marketing is an interesting area for accountants. And if somebody's not my age, they probably, if somebody's younger than me, is what I'm saying, they probably don't realize that at a point in time. Marketing was actually prohibited for a professional services firm. You you weren't able to market. You basically just uh, you know based uh, uh, your your reputation out there on what people said, and that's how you got new business. And this was this was pre seventy. So this actually does predate me from this profession as well. So just so everybody knows I'm not that old. <laughs> um, um, but then in 1977 there was a Supreme Court case, and the Supreme Court case. Uh, it was actually a law firm that went and, and sued for being able to market their services. And they won this case. I think it was uh, uh, it was Bates versus I think it was the, the I think a specific state or something like that. But it was 1977. So in 1977, based on that case, it actually was a First Amendment case, free speech. It allowed professional service firms in general to now go market their services. And unfortunately, as a profession, maybe fortunately, we'll see, we were probably very slow to act. I started in this profession in 1988 and still did not see any marketing. So that was 11 years after this. After this. The only marketing that I saw back in 1988 was yellow page ads and that was about the extent of marketing um but they did open it up so there was more marketing opportunities out there uh for companies based on this supreme court case then obviously the digital revolution came then the 90s the internet websites email you know 2000s all this came out seo became a thing i still don't understand what it is but seo became a thing um and that really you know, transformed the the way marketing was looked at. Where people, you know, we're starting to send out, you know, digital uh, monthly or weekly uh, newsletters on what they're doing, and and obviously still seems a little archaic now. Although newsletters are still important, the email part of it, um, but that was going on. And honestly, I was telling Terrell the story before we went into it. I can remember sometime in the eighties, I think it was eighties, maybe early nineties seeing an ad for an accounting firm and i was just blown away like <laughs> what accounting firms are advertising now what is going on um and just because it never happened it wasn't a thing it is so different now obviously from the 2010s going forward now we really got deep into this you know social media has become a big thing on this content marketing which is terrell is awesome at um and really getting more personalization on the marketing not just hey we're a cpa firm come talk to us it really got down to who you are and what you are so this this really opened up you know, we're talking, you know, 40 plus years ago, but we've really seen an increase this lately. Before I move on, any, 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 uh, thing you want to add onto the history, Terrell? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that that history definitely plays a role in the way we see many accounting firms approach marketing. Um, because like you said, although it changed back in what, in the seventies, um a lot of firms are still really really slow to pick up on marketing and to engage in like we haven't gotten to the point where you're seeing accounting firms doing super bowl commercials like we're very far from that <laughs> it's just like many of us are are, are are barely leveraging social media or even just even using our own websites you know and, and i find that interesting that um a lot of a lot of firms i think are still operating as if we're not allowed to market um, because I think there are some ethical things you do want to keep in mind in which you know every state society does have some ethical rules around marketing but I do think it's a it's a big opportunity for firms to really engage in in a smart and ethical way perfect all right let's uh, jump into some questions then and um I'm going to ask this first question and then Sean, you can take that, that screen off. And, and, uh, but the first thing, cause you just mentioned it a little bit on marketing, but selling as well. And there, I think there's some confusion. I think 
part of the reason that we as accountants don't market as well as we should is we are adverse sometimes to selling. If we feel like we're selling something, that's a, a, a bad word. We as accountants, and I know that I'm generalizing, but I'm pretty sure this is the case. We don't like to be sold to. Um, we, I, you know, educate me, tell me how I'm going to, you know, you're going to help me, that, help me solve the pain points I have. And so for you, when you look at marketing, because people confuse marketing and selling, how do you differentiate between those two? Yeah, I mean, it's an important question because I think a lot of people, when they think about selling, they typically go to a used car salesman is like their, their model or their mental picture about what it means to sell. And, and I think that you do have to separate, like one is that is one form of selling, or they think about like the telemarketers who are constantly calling them, trying to sell them something like that is an aspect of selling. Um, but then I think even when you take a step back from those two examples of selling, I think there are other forms of selling, but even further back, when you look at marketing, where I think marketing is something that happens before the sales process even starts. And I think when you can separate those two, it really helps people understand that like, yeah, you may not be ready to really be a, a true salesperson or to do hardcore sales, but marketing happens even before the sales process even starts. And I think the best way to kind of think about it is marketing is about how you you know, build your reputation within the industry or how do you start to let people know about your reputation and your background, about what you're about. Um, and it also becomes, I think, a great filtering process, whereas sales usually happens after you've kind of identified this person has a problem, you have a solution. Now you're just going through the process of negotiating the terms and if this is the right, you know, is this the right customer for you? Are you the right business for you, for them? And I think that is separate from just getting your reputation out there. That's a, that's a good. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, veer off of our uh, uh, questions already because that's what I do. <laughs> but let's, let's talk about that sales and marketing a little bit more because I think that's important. You said some key things there. One is I get, for some reason, I don't understand why many accounting firms, and I know there's been a switch uh, for some, but many accounting firms still look to their partners to be their salespeople. You know, this is, our partners are going to sell. We, we, and I was that way when I was a generalist, you know, years ago. And in, in 2007, when we started Tremere, we actually started with a sales team. Our third person, no, our fourth person in Tremere was actually a sales background person. That's what they were. So we probably jumped ahead. I think I was doing the marketing at that time, but somebody then we brought in somebody to do sales. So I think we you're right. I think we were doing marketing because I was educating back then. But we have, you know, seven person marketing team. We have a 20 person sales team. Why do you think, and I know some have changed, but why do you think that that firms aren't building that out and still relying on their not just partners, but but the staff as well to do the sales for them. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of firms don't understand, or I would say a lot of people who are in firms, they don't understand how buying decisions are made. Um, even though we participate in buying activity all the time. I mean, if you think about like the grocery store that you go to, or you think about the clothes that you buy, or you think about the different softwares or even if you think on a bigger items like the car you buy or the house you buy, I mean, there was a process that you went through to get there. And a lot of what happens on the front end of that process is you become familiar with either a brand or the area, the reputation around, let's say, for example, you look at the car you bought. Most people became familiar with the brand. What does this car represent? Like, what is this car on safety? What is this car on speed? If you're a person who really likes to drive, like how well does the car handle? And you look at all these different things about building the reputation for before you even get to the decision about what am I going to buy? And I think a lot of firms, when they think about the reputation, they believe that, hey, the partners are the best people to actually go out there and promote the reputation of the firm. 
which I think is not really true because when you think about who's going to actually be interacting with the clients the most, usually it's not the partners. It's usually going to be the people, either like the managers or the senior managers or even the, the, the entry level staff, if you're thinking about like an audit firm. And one of those things that I think firms haven't really grasped is that, hey, our reputation isn't just what the senior partners say or these partners who go to these dinners and, and have these discussions. It's actually you know, a collection of all the people in our organization are a part of that identity. But I do also think um, we're still living in that mindset where most people believe that the decision maker at the potential client is going to be someone really, really high up. And they don't, they only want to talk to the partner. And I think a lot of firms do have that mindset of, well, if I'm trying to close a deal, then they all, they want to talk to the highest person in the organization. And I think a lot of traditional accounting firms still operate that way, which is why the partners are the ones who end up doing most of the selling. Got it. All right. So then the transition from there. So if we are now, we're ready. We understand that we need a marketing strategy in place. It's time. You know, we've we've set the stage, whatever. We 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 know we have a target. We know we have a pain point. We can have, so whatever it is, but you know, so what changes in general does a firm going from, you know, I guess no marketing or little marketing need to put in place to be prepared when it comes to put together a whole marketing strategy? Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing is, I think you, you got to be clear about like, what is your reputation? Like, what do you want said about you when you're not in the room? Like when, if there was a conversation going on where people were talking about your firm, it's like, what do you want them to say about you? And it's like, how do you want to be described behind your back is what I tell people. Um, because it's like, those are the things that you want people to know. Like if you want people to know like, hey, we are the best at helping you understand R&D tax credits. Well, we need to work that into the messaging because to a certain extent, like if you don't talk about it, chances are your potential clients aren't going to talk about it either. <laughs> and so I think that that's where you got to really establish, like, what do you want your reputation to be is the first thing. And then after you kind of identify, like, well, what do we want our reputation to be? then I think you do have to have an honest conversation with yourself is like, all right, we say we want our reputation to be this. Are we ready to live up to that reputation? <laughs> because I've seen a lot of firms that say like, well, we want to be the best accounting firm for this. And then you look at their skill sets and their capabilities and it's like, well, can you actually deliver on that reputation? Because I'm like, it would be better for you to lower the expectations on your reputation to something you can actually deliver on than to overpromise and underdeliver. And so I do think a lot of companies have to do that second step and be honest with themselves and say, hey, can we actually live up to that reputation? Because if we oversell our image, then word is going to get around very fast. They talk a really good game, but they cannot live up to it. Yep. So, so being honest with who you are, you know, mm -hmm. but look at your skill. You used us as an example, R and D tax credits. And I mentioned when we first started, one of the first things that, that I did is I went out and educated on what R and D tax credits were, but that education, not only educated the, the client, the CPA, the tax preparer, tax advisor, EA on what these were, because back then it was, almost well this is too good to be true this can't this can't be a real thing and so i had to get past some of that but that education not only told them what it was and how their clients qualify and how what the benefit is but the secondary point of that or maybe is the you know as just as important was showed that yes we are the experts we have knowledge we understand what this is and we're able to share that with you but we're not keeping that back we're going to share that knowledge with you we are going to be the ones that are out there on your behalf that was another key marketing thing this is not us going to a taxpayer this is us going to equip you to go to your taxpayer and be the hero with that so being honest but then making sure that you are equipped with the knowledge and the expertise to take that uh, uh, to the next step i think that's extremely important 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, to your point, education is probably one of the best ways to actually start building out your reputation. Oh, yeah. Education it's, is what I've always based it on. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I mean, because I think education is the opportunity that you have to really get your reputation out there, not in a, as you say, braggadocious way of like, hey, we're the number one R&D tax rate. Like we are the experts in this. It's just like, well, instead of trying to tell you and convince you that I'm the expert, why don't I just demonstrate it? I can just educate you on, hey, here's what you need to know about R&D tax credit, because eventually what people will see is, wow, I learned so much from them about right. this. Like, hey, I'll tell other people, if you want to know about R&D tax credits, here's who you should go talk to. You should listen to them because they actually know what they're talking about. And I think that way you actually build a reputation and demonstrate it at the same time. Yep. And I want to let everybody know, I think there's some people preparing taxes while this is going on because they're not, the second <laughs> poll is up. Make sure you understand the second poll is up right now because uh, we only have a few responses there. So go in and respond to the poll and uh, and we will move on. Um, all right. So so uh, I'm going to leave that poll up while we uh, answer a few more questions here or, or, or go to a question, actually. Um, there was one question that asked... Uh, in the Q&A is, well, it's more of a question than a comment, but we can expand on this. Uh, this person says that some firm leaders don't want to give up control of to a marketing person, even if their efforts are not getting them results. I think that is a, I think that is a thing with our professions. We are a little bit of a control freak. So any comments on that giving up control to marketing? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of firms, especially senior partners, do struggle with that because I, I do think that in the traditional sense of firms, like the identity of the firm is tied to whose name is on the door um, or whose name is on the firm. And so I do think in the traditional sense, a lot of firms were holding the image or the reputation close to their chest, like, hey, this is a reflection of me. And so no one is going to be a better representation other than me. And I do think over time, what, what some partners started to realize is this is exhausting if everything is on me. And so I think what they had to do is go through this process. I'm like, hey, we have to be able to define what the reputation is outside of us because that's the only way that you can really scale and grow more is that it has to become something bigger than you as an individual. And I think that some partners are still struggling with that as, well, it's my name on the door. It's my name on the firm. It's my license. It's my reputation that's on the line. And some still believe the reason why people come to this firm is because of me and, and I think as long as you hold yourself at the center of that identity of the firm, like the firm can only go as far as you're willing to take it. But I do think at some point, whether it's, you know, you just get tired or there's some life changes that happen or, you know, God forbid something medical happens with you to where you may reach a point where you realize, like, I do want this to be bigger than me because if something happens to me, and everything depends on me, like this firm could be over, you know, in a moment's notice. Yeah. And, and boy, I got, I really want to expand on that, but I think we should get back to specific marketing because <laughs> I had a really good story. We may talk about that in a minute, but so let's, let's talk about, all right, we're good. We're, we're making this pivot. We're going to get a marketing strategy out there then. So what are the, some of the top factors uh, that are going to make a difference in this strategy that we're going to put together now? Yeah, so I think as we've talked about, you know, the reputation that we want to be, what we want to be said about us when we're not in the room, and then can we actually live up to that reputation? I think the next one is being very clear about, okay, all right, who do we want to actually attract? Like whose attention do we want to attract? Because I do think, especially with social media, like we've gone through this era or we're living through this era where people are just like, well, we just need attention. We just want to get eyeballs on what we're doing. We just want to increase our viewer count. And one of the things that I kind of learned early on, because we don't have like the biggest audience in the world, 
But one of the things that I recognize is I'm like, we needed a quality audience. I wanted to know, are we attracting the right level of attention? Because I'm like, it makes no sense if we have hundreds of thousands of people who are paying attention to what we do, but if they're not the right fit for what we're offering, like it doesn't make as much sense. And so I do think in that strategy, you do have to clarify like, who are the right people that we want to pay attention to what we are doing? And I think if you don't clarify that, you'll be very tempted to just say, hey, well, we just need to create something to go viral or we just need to get a lot of people to show up. And I'm like, you can have a lot of people show up, but nobody's paying, which means you're not going to see the real business benefit of all of this marketing activity because these aren't the right type of people you want to pay attention to your stuff. All right. So get in front of the right people. Um, have the, the strategy in place. Uh, what else? And then I think after you get, you know, you identify like who the right people are, then it's really becomes, I, to me, that is the fun part of like, okay, how do we find out where those people are? Like, for example, for us, when it came down to law firms, um, we, and we went through iterations of different types of industries, as you saw from the different content of figuring out who is the right fit. And there were some, some industries we thought were the right fit. But when we started looking at it from a business perspective, we were like, well, they're like, even in the restaurant industry at the time, we had a very limited staff. And in order for us to grow, it was going to require a whole lot more upfront energy on me. Plus the margins were smaller to where I'm like, we didn't have the cash flow to scale it and add more people to really be able to make the impact in the restaurant industry like we could have. I mean, I was, you know, self-funding the growth of the firm. And I was like, we needed to look at a different industry that had a little bit more margin because we were self-funding our growth. And so when we started looking at some other options, we came across law firms. And once we kind of settled on, hey, law firms are the niche audience we want to grow with. Then we started asking ourselves, where do lawyers tend to congregate and get together? And I think that was the fun part of just figuring out like, okay, all right, not only do we know who we want to get in front of, now we got to figure out how we're going to get in front of them. And we started realizing that, well, lawyers are very busy people. So it had to be something either you had to meet them where they were already congregating, or you had to come up with a way to get in front of them while they were multitasking, kind of doing something else. So podcasting was a great way to do it. And then also through podcasting, we started realizing that a lot of lawyers, every lawyer is part of a bar society in their state. And some of them are parts of multiple bar societies. We also noticed that lawyers were also you know, doing different business coaching programs. And so we started developing relationships with bar societies and we started developing relationships with law firm coaches. And those were the type of people we were inviting to be guests on our podcast. And as we started developing those relationships, it allowed us to understand the real problems that lawyers were dealing with. And it allowed us to start building a reputation in the space because Many of those business coaches went back and told their clients about their episode on our podcast, which meant we started getting more people. And then different bar associations would invite me in to say, hey, can you teach a, a workshop on finance for lawyers? And so I think after we identified lawyers, the next thing was, OK, let's figure out how do we get in front of the lawyers in a relevant way? All right. And that was many ways bar association now you're you are chair of the finance <laughs> committee for the yeah. bar association for the law firm finance committee yeah so so in my role as the chair of the law firm finance committee um really what we do is in that committee we create content to help lawyers understand the finance side of a law firm so it's pretty much what i was doing independently now i'm partnering with the american bar association and I have a whole committee of people to help me actually get the message out even more. 
So it's just, it allowed me to just even magnify what I was doing because, and, and I will say, people have their different opinion about this. Now, this one is more of a personal opinion to me is, I think that you should actually care about the audience that you're trying to reach. Like I actually care about lawyers uh, and I care that they get the right information because I realize that one of the biggest things that leads to any type of business failing is financial problems and financial struggles. So for me, I see, you know, really helping lawyers understand the finance side of their business as, this is not just about me making money, me growing my firm. It's actually helping them avoid one of the most critical issues to th their success as a firm and even, you know, their livelihood and the life that they live. And so I actually care about the audience I'm trying to reach. And I think you should. Um, and so for me, it was partnering with the American Bar Association allowed me to help more lawyers because I'm like, we, we actually impact and meet with and help more lawyers than we have the capacity to actually take on as clients. Like there is no way that I could take on all of the, all of the lawyers that I meet with. I can't take them on all as clients. Like we can't grow that fast. I mean, there are over a hundred thousand lawyers that are members of the American Bar Association, plus the partnerships we have with the different states from Arizona to Tennessee to North Carolina, like there's over a hundred thousand lawyers that we are interacting with and have influence with. And I'm like, we can't take on that many lawyers as clients. And so part of it, I think is not just the marketing for us to grow our firm, but it's actually to really help the lawyers that we care about. Yeah. And I think those are some extremely important things you just said there. One is finding that niche that you care about, I always say you're passionate about, you know, if you're passionate about a specific niche, man, the marketing end of things just rolls off of you somewhat because you, your passion just shows through with that. Um, you're a great example of that. Brandon Hall with real estate is a great example of that. Uh, I'm sure I can throw a bunch more out there, but when you develop that niche expertise that shows through, not only your passion, but yeah, this person has knowledge. So I think a huge part of marketing is defining a niche. Some people say niche, they're wrong, but <laughs> <laughs> defining a niche and then doing the social media, then getting the podcast, then doing the, the you know, the, the post showing the knowledge, showing your passion, uh, getting involved with the associations. Um, and then the thing is, you don't have to just have one niche. Depends on the size of your firm. Um, you know, good friend of mine who unfortunately passed away, but Josh Lance, you know, digital agencies and craft breweries, two niches that he felt really did tie together uh, mm -hmm. uh, specifically and, and did it that. And, you know, if you're a hundred million dollar firm, you're obviously not going to be one niche. You can be multiple. But uh, another friend of mine, uh, John Sensaba, he only his firm is a top 100 CPA firm. They only, and now, I'm sorry if I'm putting words in your mouth, John, this may have changed since we <laughs> talked about this a while ago, um, but they only service an industry that they have a passionate leader for that industry. So if, if they look at a client that's in, the, and this is years ago that he and I talked about this, but if they look in the client that's in fast food and they have nobody that's passionate for that industry, they're just not going to jump into it. If If they look at a client that's in the, warehousing and distribution and that they have a passionate leader for yes they'll talk to that because you can market that you can market that passion you can market that skills that knowledge that you have and so i assume niche is a, a, a an extremely important part of marketing yep i, I would agree i mean because i think that when you can really define the niche and it's something that you are passionate about i would say is marketing becomes extremely easy because, I mean, one of the things about, you know, especially, well, I would say it, marketing becomes easy for an accounting firm because I'm like, there is so much emotion that people have when it comes down to their money and when it comes down to financial decisions. And so if you have a passionate interest in that industry, then you will be able to connect and relate and speak to the emotional, the emotions tied up with, you know, the decisions that a business owner needs to make concerning their money or 
the emotions related to the taxes that they do or don't have to pay, um, the emotions related to whether they're, they're going to be able to make payroll or the emotions of whether they're going to be able to invest or whether they're going to be able to build up that, you know, that, that wealth to be able to hand to their next generation. All of these things make talking about, you know, accounting and finance such a very attractive thing if you actually care about the person that you're having the conversation with or the audience that you're talking to. And for us, we realize that understanding the emotion behind, you know, what we do was probably the thing that really helped us get even more creative about like our marketing strategy. Um, because one of the things that, you know, that people were telling us, like when we first started, it was like, oh, you got a podcast and you got to create videos. But I think as we started to really understand the audience and really understand what their emotional disposition or positions were, we realized that there are a whole lot of ways that we can execute this strategy and build a reputation. Yep. And I just want to let everybody know, uh, put down the taxes and answer the poll, and then you can go back to the taxes <laughs> here in a minute. But the, the, the polling question is is currently up. I know it's uh, uh, for those on YouTube, just so you know, it's March 28th. So we are uh, you know two and a half weeks from the end of tax season. So I wouldn't be surprised if some people are looking at taxes. But yes, please answer the poll so that we uh, can get you your CPE credit. All right. I'm going to I want to go to specific strategies a little bit more, but I want to set the stage first. You mentioned you can't handle all the clients that come to you now because of your marketing strategies, because of your niche, because of you care, your passion. This shows through. Um, Brandon Hall, though I mentioned, is the same way. When I've talked to Brandon in the past, the real estate clients, he they basically just have this you know, funnel of clients coming to them constantly and he can weed out the ones that, that won't fit for them. And he can, you know, uh, address the ones that he feels will, will fit and gets to pick and choose. That's what a really good marketing strategy does for you is that you're not selling, you're educating, you're letting this information out there and they're coming to you. So to get that started and we talked about strategy already but to get that started because people can get overwhelmed like well, I, I i i'm i just do accounting I, I can't how am i gonna you know start to show that i'm passionate about something i mean for me and i don't know if you'll agree with that but for me social media is just an easy way to start with marketing and so if we want to give like a starting tip what would that be for you how would you do that yeah, I mean, I think the, the starting tip is to start sharing your ideas, uh, your thoughts about that industry. And it doesn't have to be something that is extremely, you know, elaborate, like you don't have to go out and start a podcast because that wasn't how I started. The way I started was really just writing blogs about, you know, why finance and accounting is important to business owners. And I started off just writing very and it was like a one page blog it wasn't like this deep you know philosophical research paper it was my thoughts on paper and then we graduated to doing 60 second videos to where i could grab my phone and i can talk about it. like a lot of times it was after i had a meeting with a client it was something that they either didn't understand or something that seemed to be like you know what accountants kind of we kind of overcomplicated this topic and so I'd grab my phone in 60 seconds. I would just say, hey, here's a topic that is important to business owners, cash flow. Here's what this means. And you just explain it in a contextual way for the audience that you're trying to reach. And I think those became very simple ways of really letting people know, hey, here's what we think about this topic and why this topic may be important to you. And I think as we started doing that, we realized like, you know what, this was probably one of the more effective ways to really start building a reputation in the industry because people love the really, really, the 60 second videos, people love those. And some of them were like 30 seconds long to where people really liked it because they were like, hey, in 30 seconds, I can get a really good tip and I can move on to the next thing in my day. Yep. And, and so... When we're when we're now when we're and we've got you know five well we got ten minutes left or so so when we look at this then marketing 
easy to jump in, sharing your knowledge. Social media is a free platform. You don't have to spend money to do this. You can, but you don't have to spend money to do this. Um, when we're looking at the accounting industry in, in general for the future, I mean, how do you see marketing play in that role? And is it going to evolve? Are we going to see new ways of marketing? What do you see going on? Yeah, I mean, I think marketing is definitely going to play an even bigger role in the future because when people think about their accountants, especially as, you know, small and medium sized businesses are growing, a lot of times in those small and medium sized businesses, the people who started the business are still involved. And so for them, you know, the accountant that they work with is a personal experience. Now, if your clients are like, you know, mega corporations, Typically, the people who started those mega corporations are not the ones who are at the decision making table still. So for them, it's not as personal of an experience or as a relationship. But for a lot of the businesses where the founder is still involved, the accountant that they're taking advice from, it's more than just, hey, give me the business advice, hard numbers. It's like they have a little bit more emotional interest invested in it. So they do care about the reputation of the accountant that they're working with. And I think that that's going to require accounting firms to be a lot more vocal about, well, what is your reputation? What do you believe as an accountant? Like, who do you work with? Who do you work well with? And are you actually good at this, you know, this subject matter that you're talking about? And, and I think that in the past, the only way you really knew whether a person, well, let me say, the only way we tend to rely on whether a person was good at what they did is based on word of mouth of asking other people. But I think the smarter we get about marketing and the more tools that are available, now we can actually be in charge of telling our own story. And I think the people who are better or the firms that are better at telling their own story are going to be the ones that tend to grow and to thrive even more because I know a lot of people are concerned about, well, as private equity is coming in, they're bringing in a ton of money and they're just going to push everybody out of the business. And I'm like, well, a lot of accounting is still very relational. And even these huge private equity companies, if they can't develop that relationship and that connection with their clients, they're not going to push everybody else out of the business. It's really going to come down to who can develop that, you know, productive relationship with the potential clients, because those are usually going to be the people who win the business. Yep. And so uh, before we get to a final question, I just kind of want to give a, a little bit of a, a history of Tremerit's account uh, marketing, because I think it's interesting to see, because a lot of it plays into, and I wasn't planning on doing this, but a lot of it plays into what you said. So when we started, it was education. We talked about that already. I was out educating on R&D tax credits specifically. That was it. That was the only thing. And we specifically at that time was our niche. We avoided anything else. People would come to us and say, well, can you do this for us? Can you do that for us? Can you do this for us? But we were like, no, we're the R&D tax credit experts. That's what we're known as. That's what we want to be known as. That's the only thing. The one thing I want to real you to realize with marketing is there are other opportunities that will come out of that. We avoided it for a while, and then we realized that at some point in time, we're ready. It's ready to jump into that next niche. Still specialty tax, stick with our core values of who we are, but cost segregation came in and then energy incentives came in all specialty tax all intricate things so education was the starting point for marketing for us then as i said already salesperson came in fourth person in our our company was salesperson because now you know this this education marketing is bringing business in we had to hire some more engineers to do the work well, now I need a sales team to start bringing in more work to support those sales team. Um, and, and so we did that. At the same time, then we started, this is all playing into what you said, I think. We started writing articles for the accounting profession because that's where our, our, our clients came from. So we would, so find your niche, find whoever that, you know, law firms, whatever, start to support that. We had articles starting being published in state society magazines. And so then our name was out there. What that led to is us being recognized as a name 
and then CP associations came to us like, hey, we see you out here doing R&D tax credits. You know, we're an association of 100 CPA firms. Would you be interested, be interested in becoming a preferred provider for our firms? For our, our... And so now we're in that same niche. We support CPAs. Uh, we just have another access to them by becoming a preferred provider. Then I started to get asked to speak at these association events. So that kept building up. And this is about a 10-year period that we're, we're into now. We have not hired a marketing person yet. Probably should have, <laughs> but we have not at this point. That We started in 07. That probably started in about 18 is when we first hired a person specifically for marketing. One thing I want to tell you inside that story is that, you know, because you mentioned this too, you know, make sure you're, you're, you start a firm, you're doing everything, you're controlling everything. It goes back to that question we have. How can I give up this marketing when I don't know how this person is going to handle it? I had a little of that when I was managing partner of Trimerit. Well, I can't give up managing partner role because, you know, one, it's my identity, <laughs> you know, which is completely wrong. But that's what my mindset was. Um, and so when I did that in 2007, I mean, I'm sorry, in 2014, no, 2017, oh man, I don't remember years <laughs> anymore. 2017, that's when we started to transition from a good growth, you know, in, in a 10 year period, you know, we went from zero to 2 million. I mean, that's nice. Um, but then when we started defining people into specific roles and finding their passions and, and seeing that marketing end of things um, over the next, you know, seven years then or so, we went from 2 million to 20 million. And it was all based on marketing. It was really started when we hired the marketing person in 2018. That marketing team is now seven people. Um, what we do is everything you said, you go out and you speak and you talk and you educate. But me personally, I decided not just to stick to specialty tax. Let's make a let's let's have a strategy, whether it was intentional or not, of just supporting the profession, the accounting profession in general, with whatever we can. And that's how I started talking about mental health. And that's how I talk, started talking about firm growth and corporate culture and employee engagement and all these things. But it's still the target of accounting professionals. I'm sorry, this is your show today and I'm going on a rant here. Um, but 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 that is a key thing is just know that target, everything you've said, and then do everything you can to support it. Have passion for that target audience that you have. And then who knows where this is going to go next. You probably do. I don't. Um, where this is going to go next. But, all right, I don't know if you want to address any of that, but I'll give you a chance. But then I also want to, because where we are going to go next is, you are going to be talking about these types of topics at uh, Bridging the Gap. So why don't you give us a, a preview of what you'll be doing there? Yeah, so at Bridging the Gap, um, what what I do like about the, the you know, being able to actually take people's questions in the room, because I'm going to dive a lot more into how you execute a strategy to where we'll talk about some of the things that we're doing. Um, and at the conference, we'll have a chance to really dive into that in a little bit more detail. And I'll, I'll say for, for everyone that's listening, there's another polling question up. So poll question, um, poll question. put down the tax and answer the poll question to make sure you get your CPE credit. <laughs> but but I'll say that, I mean, at the conference, we're, we're really going to dive into some of the, the strategies. Like, for example, like I have a marketing assistant in the Philippines. And between myself being the CEO, the salesperson, the marketer, as well as business development, and this one marketing assistant that I have in the Philippines, like we create about right now we're doing about I think it's about when I add it up we're doing about I think it's like 17 pieces of content a week um, of unique content that's going out in different places and we're running that strategy with part of my time and then one full-time VA and what I'm going to talk about at the conference is exactly how did we build that pipeline up to be able to put out that much relevant content. And then some of the tools we use, like how we use AI to really shorten and improve that process. Um, also 
um, like yesterday I was doing a doing a, a, a podcast recording for one of our shows where I actually had on a amazing marketer and brand creator within the accounting industry. And what we did in that video is we walked through five of my last LinkedIn posts and she critiqued it. I mean, like we really dug in and say, okay, how could you make this better? And what at the conference is what I'm going to be doing is taking some of those small tweaks that you can make with your marketing strategy and how do you actually do it within your firm. And I'm excited because people will get to ask questions. And I always tell people is if you're in the room at a conference, you get to be as selfish as you want to be with your questions. Like you can ask me a question about your specific firm and I'm going to give you the best answer that I got because you showed up in the room. All right. Well, that's awesome. Looking forward to that. Um, and so I don't know if you want to wrap up with the, you know, I, I mean, we were marketing playbook. I don't know if you have, you know, five key, you know, bullet points that you want to summarize to, to wrap everything. If not, we can wrap it up. Yeah. I mean, I, I would say, I mean, the first thing I would say is just go back and listen to to this over and over because I do think that to really get the right marketing mindset, it does take time. It's not something you're going to hear once and then all of a sudden you switch and you do it. I mean, because thinking back to it, like accounting firms were allowed to start marketing like back in the 70s and we still haven't gotten it. And so it does take some repetition to get to it. Um, and there are tons of other resources out there that I can tell you like, hey, here are the five things you want to keep in your marketing. One of the things that I will say is a trend with social media because this becomes a hurdle for people is, well, I don't like doing video. One of the things that I've noticed is right now we're seeing actual still image photos actually performing better than our videos. And the reason why that's happening is because what we're starting to see is like we did a we did a a still image where we create went into Canva, we created it, it said the six types of statements or reports that every law firm should have. That got a ton of like circulation because a lot of people were taking screenshots or they were resharing it in a ton of different law firm communities. And like I said, it wasn't a video that we did. And all I did was we took something we commonly talk about. We just created a very simple graphic. And in the post, I think I wrote something like, this is something every law firm should know. Share this with your friends. And it went wild because people love helpful resources like that. And I think you'll hear more tips like that at the Trimeric Conference if you show Perfect. up. Perfect. Um, Sean, could you put the uh, slides back up, please? Um, so I want to just end with a couple of things that you just said to, to highlight. Um, one, um, measure, measure and optimize. You saw what was working and then you took that knowledge and, and, and you'll build on that. So when you're doing a marketing strategy, it's not just put it out there and let it go and don't don't <laughs> pay attention to it. Really pay attention to it and figure out what are the key things working and what's not. Some key things you've told me in the past is actually, you know, if you do a LinkedIn post that you really want to generate a lot of uh, traction on, you know, uh, I've done some things where I've internally just told people, hey, can you go out and reshare this and I, with our team? Can you reshare it? Can you comment on it? Can you, you know, like it? And it's unbelievable the amount of additional exposure that gets when you put that out, when they do that immediately. And that was a tip from you. So thank you for that. Um, <laughs> You know, optimize, you know, share your thought leadership, I think niche and, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, um, content marketing, all these things. I put this list together. This is my list. This is not Terrell's list. He's the expert, not me, but these are things <laughs> that I think are important. Uh, so you have these in the slide deck and look at that. And then uh, just one last opportunity to go take a look at the conference. There's the uh, btgconference.com. And I just want to thank Terrell, first and foremost, for being here today and sharing your awesome knowledge. I am just in awe of your ability to put out content and, and not just any content, but great content that gets a lot of interaction. So so you've done a great job and, and I really want to appreciate uh, I want to thank you for being here today. Hey, thanks for having me.
All right, and for everybody that wants to fill the survey out, Sean will leave the slides open for a little bit or the uh, CVN open for a little bit. You can go down to the, I mean, fill the survey out. Yeah, I think I said that. Down at the bottom right, go fill out the survey. Um, and uh, until next time, uh, we'll see you, uh, I think, uh, right after tax season with our next uh, Bridging the Gap preview webinar series. Thanks, everybody. I have